example reporting using Get With the Guidelines resuscitation, and resource availability. And now I'm going to turn it over to Cherie, and she's going to talk about um, affiliate data. The conference is now in silent mode. Sorry, everybody, I'm playing with my mute. Uh, can you hear me, Julie? We can hear you, Sheree. Okay, thank you. All right, I was like, didn't want to start talking if no one could hear. All right, um, prior to um, today's uh, session, some of you pre-registered and you received a data a PowerPoint, uh, I guess it's in PDF, but a PowerPoint um, presentation. On our last call, many of you said that some of the numbers that we looked at, you wanted to be able to have a visual. So um, that was sent out to you, and that's what I'm going to be going through um, in this part of the, of the session. However, if you did not receive that or you joined without pre-registering, which is just fine, will you um, send an email now to SWA, and like Southwest Airlines, except it stands for Southwest Affiliate, will you send an email to SWAQuality at heart.org? And Audrey, who's helping us with the call today, she'll send out uh, the, the presentation that I'm going to review. So if you did not pre-register or you don't have that in your email, just send an email to SWAQuality at heart.org. Thanks so much. All righty. Well, let's take a look. Um, the document that you have um, on the first slide says resuscitation trends for the, for the nation and for the Southwest affiliate. And I wanted us to be able on this call to be able to look, I know that you all have received a report from your director in the last week or so indicating what your current performance level is on the achievement and on the quality of uh, achievement measures. So um, I wanted to be able to show you how we are looking as an affiliate. And just as a reminder, and you'll see it on slide two, our affiliate includes Arkansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas and Wyoming. So that is um, who is represented on this call. And so I wanted you to be able to see what our performance is compared to those um, get with the guidelines resuscitation participants across the country. And so I think this also will give us an idea of where we need to focus. I know you each have your own process improvement groups working but this will give you some idea um, where you want to focus. I also might mention that the areas that people indicated that they wanted to learn a little more about, of course, included several of these measures, uh, strategies to reduce the time to shock, uh, strategies on the airway confirmation um, were two that came up in the pre-registration. So let's look at slide and let's look at the slide two. Well, we're looking at for CPA, the time to shock. Uh, being less than two minutes, two minutes or less, and you can see that um, this is an area where even across the country, if you look at, at, at an average, we are not meeting that guideline. That's what that line across the top, that 85% that number there is the goal to be recognized. So you can see that even across the nation as well as um, for us in the Southwest Affiliate, that we're falling a bit short on that area. And I would like to open the line in a little bit to talk about those of you who have um, implemented strategies to reduce that time, how you're doing that. As you look at our time to epinephrine in five minutes or less, we're doing well and, and dead even with uh, performance on a national level, as well as the percentage of our, of our cardiac arrest patients that are witnessed or monitored. And then we have um, the, the measure that was adjusted this year, which is, in, is uh, airway confirmation. And remember, the adjustment that was made was that it no longer just includes those folks that were intubated on this, at this time in this incident, but also those patients who were intubated earlier. And so they've come to us and we're needing to confirm that airway. We'll talk a little more about these specifically after we go through. And this is this chart is the adult measures. Um, we don't have enough um, hospitals doing pediatric and neonatal uh, 
for me to, it, it wouldn't be private. There's not enough to, to demonstrate the aggregate. So I did want to show you our performance nationally as it relates to the pediatric achievement measures. And remember, they're a little bit different. Again, we have airway confirmation, but we do have time to compression in less than one minute, as well as uh, the epinephrine measure. And then whether the patients who had these pulses rhythms, did those occur in an ICU setting so that we're making sure that our high-risk um, children are in a, uh, in a higher monitored setting. And then your next slide, a slide four, is our neonatal achievement measures where again, uh, nationally, we are, are exceeding the recommended levels for that for time to compression, for time to epi, and also where those patients are that these pulse um, rhythms are occurring in an ICU setting, but still having difficulty as it relates to the airway confirmation. So that seems to be a trend that, that goes through um, all of those. I might open it up, um, and I know we're, we're going to have some best practices and we're going to have them come now, but um, as it relates to the time to shock, for those of you on the phone, is there anyone who would like to um, just come off mute, star six, and tell us what strategies you've used to be able to accomplish that? Anyone willing this bright and early to, uh, to share with us? the star six and tell us what you've been doing. All right, well, think about it. Um, those of you on the phone, because we'd like to hear, um, even if you want to share it in writing, we'd be glad to send it out. So as we talk about our data, we are nearing the end of 2017. So I know that you'll start asking us, when do you need to have your 2017 data completed? So we know that you can't finish the data 1231, that you don't have those discharged, you don't have those um, coded out, et cetera. But we would like for you to use, um, your director may give you a specific uh, deadline that he or she would like you to do, but we would like you to finish your data abstraction for 2017 no later than the end of February. If you can do it earlier, that would be great. But if we finish at the end of February, then we are able to be able to look back at that data, see if there it looks like there's discrepancies, go back into charts if necessary to confirm documentation did or didn't occur, that kind of thing. So please be diligent in getting your abstraction up to date so that when the award season comes, which we, we submit those um, awards in March, that you are completely done with your abstraction and don't have to do any uh, late nights on that. So uh, if you have any questions, speak to your, um, your quality improvement director. And if you're not sure who you're working with, just email swaquality at heart.org. All right. Well, I've, we do have um, some feedback on a couple of questions that came up in um, our pre-registration. So be thinking what your hospital has done related to um, hot and co cold code evaluation. We're wanting to kind of hear what folks are doing as it relates to looking at the code immediately after it occurs and then how you're addressing that uh, in a longer term session. And also if anybody has any feedback as it relates to um, strategies you put in place related to the NT, um, the time to, not time, but the placement confirmation um, when you have intubation. Um, because that is an important uh, measure. So, uh, Julie, uh, do you want to just share what uh, Sarah saved with, shared with us uh, from St. Mary Corwin? And then I believe Nancy's on the phone and she might talk about that also. And we do not hear you. Can you hear me now, Cherie? Yes. Okay, I, was, I apologize. Um, I've been working with one of my hospitals here in Colorado, and unfortunately they were unable to join this morning, but um, in regards to hot and cold evaluation and debriefing, um, they had been struggling with their debriefing for post-CPA and MET events. Um, it appeared that since they transitioned to a different um, electronic medical record program in April, the hot debriefing had 
um, fallen by the wayside. And they noticed that when they did a root cause analysis, they were not, that's about the time that it had stopped. Um, they found that the nurses and staff were a bit overwhelmed by the new paperless system, that the debrief um, has not been properly documented recently. However, we were having a skills fair um, next week for critical care, telemetry, and ED nursing staff in the education department, and they had planned on having a station that highlighted the importance of team debriefing and how we can once again adopt this um, practice back into their codes for patient safety and improved outcomes. Um, the cold debriefing will now be discussed in a bi-monthly cold blue and a rapid response subcommittee made up of staff from the above three departments and our quality department. Um, they're really making sure that they loop their quality department back into um, the debriefing efforts. Um, they're going to discuss cases that have been abstracted and ha have highlighted for discussion. Um, their first official meeting will be held this Thursday prior to the skills fair. So that's what uh, an example of what this one hospital is doing, and we would love to hear, um, does anyone else have any examples that are working, or maybe even examples that aren't working so well, but you're really working to try to perfect? Don't be shy. Well, Nancy, I think um, we have Nancy Cass on the line from Baylor Scott & White Round Rock, and she, um, they are a high-performing hospital, and I had asked her to share a little bit about um, what they've been working on and some strategies that have worked for them. Nancy, can you join us? Just star six and you'll be on. Are you there, Nancy? Well, she may have had something come up. Um, while we're waiting for her, I've had quite a lot of questions as it relates to um, the um, endotracheal tube confirmation. And so I thought I might um, just give a little background as to that measure. Um, this, there was a webinar given on the new measures in May of 2017, and if you were on our last uh, call, um, I actually sent out the link after that so that you could hear about the new measures and why, they, why it was so important to add this airway confirmation, not only for the patients that were intubated this, at this time, but those who were brought in who had been intubated previously. And I thought that it might help you um, we also, they did that discussion based on 13 pieces of um, literature that indicated. And so I thought I'd share a little bit with you about that. Let me get to the correct page here. All right. Um, of course, it is not only the American Heart Association that has made this recommendation. Um, if you look at the American College of Emergency Physicians, this is also an updated guideline for the patients that are being cared for in the emergency department. And so um, I'll just read from their policy a little bit. Confirmation of proper endotracheal tube placement should be completed in all patients, um, both in hospital and out of hospital settings. And of course, that's not only initially, but also to conf confirm that it is there correctly. The recommendation, as with the AHA guideline, is to use in-tidal carbon dioxide detector, and we suggest a continuous waveform capnography for this purpose um, to evaluate and confirm endotracheal tube position in patients to make sure they have adequate tissue um, perfusion. This is such a foundational, and I know for some reason, I think I have a feeling this is being done, but it is not being documented and I'd be interested um, in some confirmation of that. But um, it is so vital when you think about um, oxygen being able to get so that everything that you're working on depends on oxygenation. And if that is not properly placed, then all of the other things that you are doing um, simply aren't going to be as effective. 
And so um, I think there have been some concerns. So I'd be interested in, in hearing from you how if your physicians have um, balked on this or questioned if it was going to take additional time or, or what. But this is really is a foundational element. There are a few time frames when, um, when capnography will not work for you. If there's a huge pulmonary embolism, of course, that will be an indication that there's something else going on because that uh, the uh, numbers are not going up or they've had a severe um, reduction. The other benefit of using the waveform capnography is to determine um, ROSC um, because when you have an immediate increase there, it gives you early detection that you do have a return you do have a return of circulation. So there's many benefits. So I've been a little bit surprised um, that we're not seeing higher numbers on that. But again, I think it's something where the documentation is not uh, there for the abstractors. Do I have any comments as it relates to, as you've looked at your data um, on this measure, um, as, to, as to what the situation is? Anyone? Star six? And Nancy, if you've gone on the phone, feel free to star six and, and hop on. All right, well, we're going to move along and talk a little bit about accreditation and how your resuscitation database really does impact um, what sections of the standards. I did provide on your slides, these happen to be Joint Commission standards, and I am not um, being biased to those of you who use other, other accrediting organizations, but you will have very similar, um, very similar. Uh, standards that apply. This is slide five uh, for those of you who received the slide. And so um, this is why it's so important and why we feel like Get With the Guidelines Resuscitation is such an awesome tool uh, to have the data and be working with the data as your accrediting organization requires. And certainly when we look on page five and we're talking about the standards, and this, as I mentioned, this is under the chapter Provision of Care Treatment Services. Um, the chapters may be named slightly different with your other accrediting organizations, but I assure you um, these, this is there. So for standard PC 9.30, that resuscitation services are available throughout the hospital. So that's, on, that's not going to only include that you have policies, procedures, processes to make sure that the resuscitation um, services are available, but also is the equipment there and available? How much time um, would it take to get the appropriate equipment there? Is it placed strategically? By using your Get With the Guidelines reports, and I'll show you some, some ways to do that, you can certainly be able to determine if there are places in your organization where the equipment is too far. Um, do you have an evidence-based training program to train the staff? That's also a good use of your Get With the Guidelines is you can run reports by units if you capture those to see where you might need additional training because wherever you have anything related to variation, um, that you might want to do a root cause analysis. On slide six, the, again, still in the chapter, provision of care, treatment, and services. Um, we have the issues related to medications, and certainly the medications that are involved in a code um, need to be properly and safely stored, and they need to be consistently available. And there's other issues you'll work on related to control and security, but having them available is critical, and you can prove that that's one way to use your database for that purpose. Slide seven. This is a different chapter. This is your PI chapter, your Improving Organizational Performance chapter, and it has got several really important um, uh, standards that, that get with the guidelines resuscitation or however you're collecting your data can be used, and that is standard PI 1.10 that the hospital collects data to monitor the performance of potentially high-risk processes. And certainly, everything that we look at as it relates to MET, ARC, and CPA is considered a high-risk process. And that that data is systematically aggregated and analyzed. 
So if you are just putting data in to get with the guidelines resuscitation, and certainly for the purpose of recognition, that is fine, but it does not meet this standard. The beauty of get with the guidelines resuscitation is how to run your report. And if you haven't set, if you're not sure how to how to slice and dice that data, and I'm going to show you a couple examples, please call your your quality improvement director today. If you're not sure who that is, email swaquality at heart.org. And we want to show you the, the power of the reporting side of Get With the Guidelines Resuscitation. It's really neat. And it will allow you to systematically aggregate and analyze your data and be able to show that to your, your um, surveyors. Slide eight, um, to look at undesirable patterns or trends in performance. That is part of what you want to do through your process improvement. And again, I'll show you a, an example slide coming up. And then to use that information to make changes to improve um, performance. If you have implemented changes, make sure you run your Get With The Guidelines data for the related measures before and after that implementation to confirm that what you're trying to change has worked. This is a great way to run a chart, and you can even have an arrow for your surveyors. This is where we implemented. You can put another chart, this is where it didn't work, so we redesigned, we implemented, and you can use your data and get with the guidelines resuscitation for that to make that decision process. Slide nine, um, this is that uh, standard, um, this is under the chapter information management, and I, I did not put that on here, I apologize. The hospital has process in place to effectively manage information, including the capturing, reporting, processing, storing, retrieving, so on and so forth of data. And this certainly is an area where Get With The Guidelines Resuscitation can help you. Um, I think I had this later in the, in, the, in the webinar, but I think I'll go ahead. This is an example of how to use your report. Um, as you know, when there is variation, then you don't have high quality. And what you're able to do is to take your data, and that's what the blue line is. It is a particular hospital. I, I don't even remember who I used, but a hospital who had a pretty a decently high volume. And looking at their time to first shock, less than or equal to two minutes for, for VF pulseless and VTAC as the first documented rhythm, and then comparing it to that large number of patients across the country. So as you look, and this happens to be quarterly, um, as you look, and we did it, I did it July 15 through August 2017. So it's a way for you to see the variations that occur. You can also, perhaps, I could have run this monthly to see if there were annual trends. We see that in teaching hospitals where we have a brand new set of um, residents on July 1st, and if you will run their reports across the continuum for a few years, you will see that there is, a, a, there is a variation that's immediately after the whole new group of, of uh, residents comes in. So anyway, this is a great way to look at that. I would encourage you, I included an article, that's a link on that page, an article about the variation in code blue at a big hospital. And this is a very, kind of a very interesting article. It, it, they don't tell you which hospital it is, but it shows all of the various things that impact code blue. And everything from a delay in CPR, a delay of the a delay activation of the team, uh, that they're not getting a good bag valve mass seal, inadequate ventilations, inadequate compressions, medication errors. It just goes through every one of the things that cause variance in a code blue. And I would encourage you to look at that article um, it was kind of eye-opening when you think about that. But this is an example of how you can slice and dice your data. And then on slide 11, um, look at things based on the day of the week. This also, and I don't have it on here, but this is also um, time to shock for a particular hospital, and it is done by the day of the week. So while this hospital has a 73% in this measure, 11 of 15, you can, using your tools, look at your performance by the day of the week and compare it. And so while this is a very low number of, of uh, patients, you can still see that it's, it's pretty interesting 
that um, two of two on Tuesday, two of two on Wednesday, one of three on Thursday. They got everybody on Friday, but interesting, it was only 33% on Saturday. And note they hadn't had any codes on a Sunday because this is a small volume facility. That's interesting that out of the three um, of these rhythms that occurred on a Saturday, that only one of three received the shock in two minutes or less. So I do encourage you to look at different measures by the day of the week. Um, that is a good way to get on top of uh, training and educational needs. And so I also included an article on that page. And for those of you who didn't get these slides, um, we'll send them out afterwards. And um, for everyone who pre-registers, you always get the slides in advance. So I put an article on that slide that's called Code Blue for Code Blue. And so it's a, a kind of an interesting article on how to get on top of, of some of these elements uh, related to uh, how to use your data, how to determine where the problem is, kind of a root cause analysis. Um, our emails are on the last slide, both Julie and I, as well as the SWA quality. So you certainly should always be speaking with your director. But if you don't know who that is, feel free to ask any of us um, your questions. So let's see. Uh, da -da. Oh, Julie's going to talk about a few resources that we have for you out there. Hi, hey, Cherie, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. Um, I think that you've made some great points, Cherie, and I know in working with my hospital that it seems as though many of these um, measures are being done, but it's just um, being able to go in and actually find the documentation if the documentation is there. Um, I think most often the hospitals don't have a good process in place to to get um, to get it documented. So once they, they streamline that, it looks like their measure scores are coming up substantially. So, so I think that's, that's a great point. Um, some of the resources that we have available is um, we are frequently getting asked to add abstractors um, to uh, various modules, and we're going to speak specifically just to resuscitation. Um, for resuscitation, an abstractor must um, actually pass a test. Um, before they can become what we call a certified abstractor and be added to the list, the approved user list. So if you have an abstractor or a person who wants to become an abstractor, notify your director in the state in which you live and um, we'll sh tell you how to do that here at the end to send an email. And then um, that director can help you kind of go through the process that must be gone through. Um, there, there's a link that we'll send you out to, to where you will do some training and do kind of a practice test, and then there will be a pretest, and then there will be your official test that you get to do. And then once you pass that, then we will work with you to get you signed on with a username and password, and you can begin abstracting. But please know that your director in the state that you live in is there to kind of work with you step by step and help you through the processes to make this as seamless and painless as possible and, um, and get you up and running just as quickly as we can. Um, also make sure... Hey, Julie, I might just yeah. jump in there. Um, just a reminder that if you are not an abstractor but you want to have access to the data to slice and dice it, you, you don't have to take the test. So... Um, many of the of you on the phone, maybe you're an abstractor, but maybe you're an abstractor and a leader, or maybe you're just the leader. <laughs> um, you can become an, a, an observation only user of your data without um, taking the abstraction test. So think about who in your organization you might want to get on board as one of those types of users um, so that we can really use this uh, data well. Maybe somebody in your quality department, maybe somebody higher up in cardiovascular um, or in accreditation. So um, I think sometimes people think, oh, I have to take that test, I'm not going to do it. Well, you can get access to just view your data without taking the test. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sheree. And then also, um, you do have the ability to be availability to run your 2016 risk standardized survival report. 
um, just make sure you're using those and comparing those. And if you are uncertain how to do that, please reach out to one of us directors in the state that you live in, and we're always glad to walk you through that. Um, that's the beautiful thing about the Get With the Guidelines Resuscitation module is that the, the reporting function is so robust that we can slice and dice data in ways that you could never imagine. So, um, and I think that that was very true where Cherie was able to point out that um, certain days of the week are going to affect um, patient outcomes. And I think that if it was one of your loved ones, certainly, um, you know, those those Saturdays are, are certainly something that's very concerning. So how can you work with your quality director to improve outcomes for those patients that are that are having events on Saturdays or the weekend. Um, our um, resuscitation conference at Scientific Sessions is soon coming up, and there will be a separate resuscitation conference that will be November 11th and 12th, and then Scientific Sessions directly following that, November 12th through the 15th. So if you've not registered for that, please do so. And um, you can reach out to one of us or we'll give you an email address here at the end and um, we'll get you connected that way. And then December 12th is a Resuscitation Sciences webinar and be watching your email for that promotion to come out very soon. So Cherie, I'm going to pass it back to you. Yeah, I might just add, you know, that risk standardized, that risk standardized survival report this is so important. There's really no other place you can get that information. When we run in the database, when you run survival, it is not risk adjusted. So when you're doing it inside the configurable report, it's just um, what I consider just a baseline. It, it doesn't take any factors into consideration. However, when you go to your home page and it's down, kind of halfway down the page to the right, and it says risk. Um, standardized, um, not risk, risk standardized survival report, and you open that up, that is for your hospital alone, and it has taken into consideration, um, I forget if it's 11 different indexes, I don't have the number, but many number of elements to determine if you had sicker patients so that you really are looking at an apples to apples comparison because taking a community hospital survival rate and then taking a academic center or a research organization and comparing those is not really a good way to go. We don't know what the expected survival was. By looking at that risk standardized survival report, or you can call it risk adjusted, you are finally getting that number. And you know, we have talked over and over um, at least through American Heart and through the groups that I interact with about the survival rate from cardiac arrest. Um, with that being under 30%, um, actually we've gone up from 19%, but in-hospital survival from cardiac arrest remains consistently below 30% across the country. And so it is really important, all the things that you're doing to improve that survival rate and have a good number for it. So if you have not looked at that, open it up. Now, the unfortunate part is because so it is so involved, you only get it annually, but it is, it is scientifically developed by our clinical work team, um, by the physicians who work with us, and it is something that is only really available through Get With The Guidelines Resuscitation. And in fact, probably one reason to even have it is the availability of that report. So if you haven't seen it, go find it or call your director or let us know at SWAQuality at heart.org. All righty. I don't know if Nancy had a, ch a chance to um, join us from Baylor Scott & White Round Rock. Are you on? All right, no problem. Something we know how it happens in, in nursing. Things come up. So um, I don't know if I can get. I haven't been very. Uh, I haven't been very successful at getting you guys to talk up. But I'd just be interested. I have a few questions. I'm hoping um, you might be willing to share. Um, can folks on the line? Can anyone tell me? Um, are you all abstracting your own data, or do you have some abstract abstraction help? If you can come off uh, mute star six. 
tell us who you are in your hospital and who is abstracting your data. Is anyone willing to share? It's an easy question. All right, well, I may put this out in a little survey. I'm just interested in seeing who's abstracting, getting a feel for what PIs you're working on currently, and then there's going to be a little question, um, if you could change one thing about your performance, what is the thing that you're really working on, what that would be? So in the post-participation um, um, survey, I will put those in there. So. Unless, unless we've got some, uh, some contribution from the group, uh, I'll pass it over to Julie. Yeah. Does anyone want have anything they would like to share or, or not? And I think this is also a great opportunity and a safe place that if you have something that's not working well in your hospitals, we, we find in our other groups that, you know, it's... Um, sharing things that are not working well and then all you know having others there that can make suggestions has been kind of a lifesaver for many people. All right. Well, thank you so much for attending. We really do appreciate it. And our next quality um, exchange for resuscitation will be held January 31st at 8, 8 a.m. Central Time. Um, this brings us to the end of our quarterly data exchange. If you didn't pre-register, please email swaquality at heart.org, swaquality at heart.org, and let us know that you did attend. And all attendees will receive a resource mailing and a short survey so that we know um, what you want to hear about next quarter. Um, and we can make sure that we tailor these to the specific needs of the hospital, um, because we do want it to be about you and improving patient outcomes. So unless anyone has any further questions or um, comments, we will go ahead and adjourn for today. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you.